if you think about self-efficacy, it is um, this idea that someone believes that they are capable of achieving uh, the goals and mastering goals. And then if you go back to that first theme I presented to you, which was alignment, there's the potential that this approach leads to teachers having a much greater feeling of self-efficacy over their mathematics teaching. So if I believe as a teacher I want to teach in this way and there's something which is, an enab is enabling me to teach in that way, that means I've got a much greater sense of self-efficacy over my own teaching, which is going to lead to a much more positive experience for me as a teacher. The second thing, potentially, this is also going to lead to greater self-efficacy um, amongst the children in their solving of math problems, because as the teachers were saying, they're allowing the children far more freedom to approach things in their own way and time to think about things. It's not, this is the way to do it and I'm going to show you how to do it. It's, here's a problem, I wondered which way you could solve it. And I guess we could kind of theorize that potentially this is going to lead to greater amounts of growth mindset uh, in classrooms amongst teachers and children. Uh, I, I'm sure lots of you have heard of this idea of growth mindset. It's this idea that somebody believes that they are capable of growing their own intelligence. So the complete opposite to what I talked about at the beginning, that myth that we have in our country that you're either good at maths or not, and good at maths means you are a good, uh, intelligent person. This is the kind of opposite. Growth mindset means somebody has a belief they can grow their intelligence through hard work and practice and effort. So I guess we could speculate that potentially this approach will lead to uh, increased levels of growth mindset. And one of our next jobs is to look at, well, what kind of an impact is it having on teachers' mindsets? And what's the link between a teacher's mindset and the children's mindset? Not very much research has been done into this, but I suspect if a teacher is having a growth mindset about mathematics, we're far more likely to find children who then develop growth mindsets about mathematics. The whole idea of a role model. If someone is showing the children a way of being, then they're more likely to see that and imitate it to an extent. OK, uh, the third one, uh, positive attitudes. The teachers are saying, well, the children are enjoying maths. The lowest ability children, they're enjoying maths. The manipulatives are allowing them to access the stuff, and therefore they're beginning to realize they can do this, the maths. Which is taking me on to the fourth one, accessibility. This is a really important one, uh, because you know in our country, mathematics is an important thing. Uh, it's a really important indicator of economic kind of success later on in life. And at the moment, we have large numbers of children who are failing in maths. Uh, and what we're finding in this approach is that teachers are saying, ah, yeah, those children who were previously failing in maths, I'm really surprised by them. They are actually accessing the same stuff as everybody else, whereas in the past I just used to give them easier work or lower level work. All right, we've got a few moments for questions. I wonder if I could actually start off with a question, yeah. though. And um, I just wondered in your research whether you found any difference between younger teachers and what we might describe as more mature, experienced colleagues. Yeah. And again, bearing in mind the sort of gender composition, and particularly in most primary yeah. schools, between female teachers yeah. and male teachers. Yeah, so it's a really good question. Um, I didn't go into loads of detail about our sampling and things like that. Uh, the teachers I spoke to were mostly women, one man, um, because simply <laughs> it's, there aren't very many men teaching that I know anyway. Uh, but there was a whole range uh, from uh, an NQT who was brand new to teaching to people who have been teaching maths for many years. Um, and really, there was very little difference in the things that they were saying, except the new teachers, especially the NQT, who hadn't experienced much else, this is what she knew about maths teaching. Whereas the more experienced teachers had a much, could, had a much better idea of what this was like compared to what they used to do. So I guess that's the main difference between the, the teachers who had been teaching for longer and the ones who had been teaching for a shorter time. Um, but really, they were all expressing similar things about the approach. So those themes were, were similar across, across both of them. Same for men, although I only interviewed one man, so it's hard to say. Yeah. Thank you. So I wonder if there's any questions from, from the floor. There's a gentleman in the centre there. Morning, Andy. Um, I'd just like to ask you a little bit about the, what you said about leadership mm. and link that with judgment. Mm. Uh, did the teachers actually talk about um, any ways in which they might overcome that, or was that just something they felt they couldn't deal with? Yeah, it's a really good question, actually. Um, 
that was actually something I didn't pick up on today um, deliberately because I was focusing in on those particular things which I were talking about. But uh, it's something that lots of teachers did talk about, actually. They talked about what it was in their school that had enabled them to uh, develop their practice. And there's a couple of things, actually. Uh, the first thing was that a lot of teachers um, talked about opportunities to go in and watch their colleagues teach and team teach with their colleagues and kind of visiting other classrooms and having people coming in into their classroom. So uh, I can remember one in particular, a lady who said, I hate people coming to my classroom. But when I started this, people kept coming into my classroom. <laughs> they kept wanting to see what it was. And she said, that, that um, made such a difference for me. And this is something not just her was saying, lots of teachers were saying similar things. They were saying, people coming into my classroom and watching me, but not watching me to give me a grade, watching me to learn and help me learn, actually m made them feel far more confident and helped them develop their practice, I guess, in a safe kind of place. So rather in our country, I guess we quite used to historically, if someone's coming into your lesson, you feel like you're being judged. But lots of teachers talked about this idea of going into each other's classrooms, watching each other teach, team teaching, planning lessons, and kind of coaching each other and working alongside each other. And that was one of the key things that uh, lots of them said had helped them develop their practice. Yeah. Hi. Hi. Um, I just wondered, when you um, introduced this approach, was there anything that didn't work? Were there any barriers to this new approach? Um, there are lots of barriers. <laughs> it's a simple answer. Yeah. Um, I won't go through them all. Um, but some of the main barriers are things like, well, I'd actually summarise the main barriers as traditional practices in schools. So things like marking policies, um, uh, planning. <laughs> in fact, I'd probably summarise them as things that I would say don't matter, but lots of teachers think they do matter. So the main barriers were where teachers and schools had very strict policies about the way things should be marked or the way feedback should be given and think the way things should be assessed. Um, and we've kind of worked very closely with lots of schools to work out, you know, what are the really important things, what are the key principles, and what things actually can be changed based on, you know, what effective practice tells us, what research tells us. Um, the other barriers, again, happen in year two and year six, and I hate to say it, but they're because of the test, because the tests happen now at this time of year, and so you have these teachers trying to cram this huge amount of content into a relatively short space of time. So even though teachers were saying, this has given me the opportunity to slow down in lessons and stop speeding through things, there's this kind of um, th this battle going on between wanting to teach like that but I have to cover all my content in time for the SATs, <laughs> which is a, it's a barrier whether we like it or not. Um, so, yeah. Uh, did you come across any members of staff who weren't uh, sort of on board with the scheme and, and, you know, were sort of resistant to change, mm. if you like, and how did you overcome that? Yes. <laughs> yes, it's the simple answer. We did come across people like that. Um, and the way that we, we've kind of... Obviously, in our school, we've had that, and we've spoken to other schools who've had that and worked alongside them. And again, it goes back to the, the first question, I think, which was about leadership and providing those people with opportunities to go and work alongside other teachers in the school and kind of team teach and see the impact this was having. So one of the most important things for a lot of schools I know has actually been to develop key teachers, key uh, teachers who are kind of really leading this. They might not necessarily have been maths coordinators or leaders originally, but people who are, are kind of taking this and rolling with it, and they become quite key players in the school. Uh, and then you use, we, we use them uh, to kind of spread it and uh, work alongside those teachers. So it's, it's not simple, <laughs> but no, that's the way thanks. we do it. thanks. That's what we're trying to do at the moment. Yeah, so. yeah. I don't think there is a quick fix. I wish there was. <laughs> and I think it's a, a lady in the corner. Hello, thanks, um, Andy. Yeah. Just talking about marking, mm. um, it is a really difficult area, and yeah. I just wondered what you had decided to do with maths marking. With the textbooks and stuff. In workers. your school, yeah. yeah. Um, we're Not quite necessarily just oh, with the textbooks, but yeah. with the, you know, the general yeah. process of Everything. working in this way. Yeah. Okay. Yes, yeah, good question. We're really happy. I don't know if you've come across the document by NCETM, which is all about marking and feedback, which came out recently. 
Um, I can't remember what it's called, but just search for it. And the National Centre for Excellence in Teaching Maths, they have brought out some guidance on marking uh, and feedback in maths. Uh, and I'm really glad because what they said is exactly what we were trying to do, which is this. Um, stop trying to write um, endless next steps marking and that kind of thing, because in maths, when you're using a textbook, you know what your next step is because it's the next lesson. It's been designed by a subject specialist <laughs> who knows more than you, and it's there in the textbook. It tells you. So you don't need to write a target or 30 targets in books because it's there. If someone wants to know, they can pick up the textbook and have a look what's coming up. Um, so we, we quickly got rid of that. Uh, the other thing we paid a lot of attention to is this idea that immediate feedback, immediacy of feedback is central to uh, its effectiveness. And again, it's not a new thing. I mean, there's current research which shows that, but uh, Benjamin Bloom, who's one of the people who wrote about mastery in the 60s and 70s, he also said the same thing. Uh, if you want to teach to mastery, you need to provide children with immediate feedback about their performance on the same day, preferably in the moment, is even better. And so our marking and feedback pol policy reflects that. It reflects this idea that marking and feedback should happen in the moment. So we use various tools like iPads that we can kind of take photos of work and annotate and put on the screen, uh, verbal feedback happening, um, that kind of thing. So really, that's what we do. Uh, the third thing um, is when we're marking, whether it's journals or um, workbooks, we are very clear with our teachers that they have to differentiate between what's a misconception, okay, flagging up something which shows you the child really doesn't understand the maths concept, and what's, what's not that, what's just a simple kind of uh, slip or an error or something, okay? Is, is the problem that the child doesn't understand the maths concept, or is the problem that the child um, is just really unattentive? <laughs> And therefore, that's a different issue. If a child is not very precise with their working out or with their uh, work that they're doing, that's a totally different issue you need to tackle than someone who doesn't understand the concept. There's no use giving feedback on, you've got to learn to multiply two-digit numbers, if a child already knows that, but they just don't bother checking their work. <laughs> so often, feedback is about learning behaviours rather than mathematical concepts. <laughs> 